Morning, everyone. How are we today? Enthusiastic. I, I believe I'm meant to touch the Blarney Stone. I'm not going to kiss it. That would be wrong, but I'm going to touch it. This is magnificent. Um, I am Simon Stewart. I'm here to talk to you about moving to Bizzlemod. Um, I've heard it pronounced BZLmod, but I'm English, so BZLmod would sound wrong. Bizzlemod. Um, when you're launching a campaign, when you're trying to do something new, it's good to take some um, knowledge and experience from the ancients. I think that Sun Tzu's Art of War is probably a little bit aggressive, and I have a feeling that uh, the, the um, Greek philosophers never built any software. So instead of listening to that, I'm going to explain to you about moving to Bizzlemod, explained using the wisdom of 90s pop. For those of you who don't have a one at the beginning of their birth year, that was in the last millennium. I am the one and only, nobody I'd rather be, as Chesney Hawks told us. I've been working in Build since about 2013. That's when I joined Facebook. At Facebook, they give you uh, bootcamp tasks. Uh, and within three days, I'd found a null pointer exception in their brand new build tool, which is called Buck. Now, I could have worked around this issue because who wants to go and fix a build tool? It turns out I wanted to fix a build tool. So I sent a, sent a bug fix, and then I sent another, and then I accidentally joined the build team. And then I accidentally ended up being the lead of the build team at Facebook, which was an exciting experience. And Buck was modeled after Bazel. Because one of the things that happens is Googlers leave Google, and they miss a whole bunch of stuff. And in the diaspora, they go, oh, I wish I had Blaze. And so we created Buck. But when Bazel became open source, that was brilliant news. And uh, I leapt on it when I had the opportunity. I had the opportunity when I moved to Apple, where I am now, where I'm part of the build team uh, in iCloud, working with Bazel and distributed builds. As part of my Bazel work, I've become a maintainer of several rule sets. And those are the rule sets that I'm going to be talking to you about today. Those rule sets are rules JVM external, Apple rules lint, and contrib rules JVM. I'll be going into more detail about them. So tell me why. It ain't nothing but a heartache. <laughs> when we start our Bazel projects, we tend to just use the built-in rules, right? We're doing some Java or some C++. Let's take Java. That's the language I'm most familiar with. And we start using the built-in rule sets. And that's magnificent until we want to use something from an external repository um, in the Maven ecosystem in the Java world. And then we add a rule set. In our case, rules JVM external. So we're building happily, and we're now pulling things down. And, and it's going brilliantly. And then somebody goes to us, you know what this application needs? And you go, no. And they go, a web front end. And so you do what any right-thinking person does, and you uh, hit Twitter, and you go, what's hot? And people go, React. And so you pull in rules, Node.js, and you start building with that, and, and that's good. And then you realize that it'd be kind of nice if you had like a Go helper application to do some of the work for you. So you pull in rules, Go, and you run Gazelle, and everything is ticking along nicely, until somebody says to you, you know how we're going to deploy this? And you go, mm -hmm. And they go, use Docker. And you go, fine, fine, fine. So you pull in rules Docker, and suddenly your build falls apart. Like Different rule sets have different versions of different transitive dependencies, and you need to get them lined up just so in order to get everything working. Things get messy. It's heartache, right? And tell me why. It ain't nothing but a mistake. So one of the things we could do to work around this is we could use federated rule sets. The Bazel team tried this themselves for a while. There was uh, the Bazel Federation. We took this idea at Apple, and we have uh, a set of federated rules that we use. Um, and it's nice, right? We can control the order in which dependencies are loaded. And uh, you know, people just pull in features when they need it. They don't need to figure out whether they need you know, rules Docker, rules Node.js, rules JS, rules Python, rules Py. Rules Contrib JVM, uh, Rules JVM External, Rules Java. They don't need to worry about any of that, which is thankfully a relief. They just go, from the Federation, give me the Java feature, or give me the Docker feature, or whatever it is they need. 
That's really nice, right? So, so federated rule sets must be the way forward. So, you've got a federated rule set. And that don't impress me much. And there's a reason for that. It's because it's really painful to maintain these things. Like every time we find a problem when we roll out a new version of the rule set, we put a test case into our, into our test suite and we go like, that problem will never happen again. And sure enough, it doesn't, but another problem pops up as we pull in different versions of different things. It's chaotic, it's anarchic, it's unpleasant. The only way that we can really validate that the rule sets all play nicely together is to prepare a release and then patch it into the various large clients that we work with and go like, does it work for you? And if it works for you, we go like, that'll be good enough, right? We can't validate that this thing is correct. We can't validate the absence of errors. What we can say is, in the test cases we have and in the situations we're building in, we're not aware of any errors. So federated rule sets are kind of nice, but they're incredibly expensive to maintain. We're lucky we have a build team, and we maintain that as a central resource that's shared by everyone, but not everyone has that capability. So I'll tell you what I want. What I really, really want. It's not a zigga zigga, you'll be pleased to hear. It's package management for Bazel rule sets. That would be nice, right? Like everywhere else we go, there are package managers. You're working in Java, there's a Maven ecosystem. JavaScript, the Node ecosystem. Python, PyPy. Heck, if you're running Linux, there's a package manager for that. Right? In fact, several. There's millions of the things. You can just pick whatever you want to. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a package manager for Bazel rule sets? And in Bazel 6, with Bazel mod, there is. It's wonderful. So with this, rather than having uh, a large work workspace, you just have a module.bazel. And the nice thing with the module.bazel is it replaces many lines of repeated stanza that you have in your workspace with a single declaration. What do I mean by stanza? I mean, when you pull in a feature from a federation, or in fact, most other rule sets, you tend to have the HTTP archive. You tend to have the load of the uh, function that provides the transitive depths. You call that function. Then you have the load of the setup function that sets everything up, like toolchains, and you call that function. So you replace four lines with one. It's really quite a nice way of working, right? So I'm not just going to be talking about what Bizzle mod is. It's a package manager for Bazel rule sets. That's pretty clear. I'm going to talk about how we moved some of the rule sets that I'm a maintainer of toward being compatible with Bizzle mod. And the first one I started with uh, was rules JVM external. All I want to do is have some fun before I die, said the man sitting next to me out of nowhere. The man sitting next to me was a person organizing the sprint. Um, rules JVM external, if you're not familiar with it, is a rule set that allows you to interact with the Maven ecosystem. So it allows you to download dependencies from Maven, um, use them in your build, and at the end of the day, using a Java export, upload them into a Maven repository. And that allows you to have a Bazel project interact seamlessly with the rest of the Java ecosystem. This is what it looks like at the moment. Uh, if you've ever used Java on a Bazel project, you probably have something like this. So maven underscore, underscore install, this is in your workspace file. Um, typically, the name is defaulted to uh, maven because this is a macro. Uh, and you can see here that we depend on some artifacts. So here, we're depending on Guava, common CLI, SLF for JSimple, and Google Java format. We have a lock file, and that's called the maven install JSON. And you can see that down at the bottom. And uh, we are handling the common error case of somebody updating the declaration in the workspace, but not repinning their dependencies by having the fail if repin required true. Um, by the way, if you're using rules JVM external, I really recommend just setting that flag. It'll save you so much pain and grief when you're debugging things. Finally, we, set, we fetch sources because when you're working in an IDE, it's kind of nice to be able to delve into what on earth is happening in the library I'm using. So this is what it looks like in Bazel 5. This is what it looks like in Bazel mod. Uh, we have uh, loaded the extension, we've assigned it to Maven, and we're using um, a tag class called install. It's basically the same, right? This is going to be really easy. The only ma minor change is we have replaced Maven install JSON with lock file. Because normally when you're talking to people, you say, what's the lock file? Have you updated that? And trying to just get the nomenclature 
uh, slightly more correct. So this is, this is fantastic, right? We're done. We're done, right? Insert meme with Anakin Skywalker. But we're not, because Maven install is a macro, and tag classes are only allowed to use uh, uh, items from the Atta module that you have in, in Bazel. So if you've ever written a rule, you've come across the Atta module. That's the one where you go like Atta label, label list, string dict, or apparently random blob of data in this particular case. <sighs> That's going to be a problem, right? Like, we need to be able to express this kind of thing in the brave new world of Bizzlemod. How are we going to do it? And I was talking with the, with the team working behind Bizzlemod and trying to figure out, like, how do I do this? And the, the piece of information they gave me was that the tag classes can be thought of as macros. So this is a macro, right? Like net sourceforge pmd pmd dist actually expands into a blob that has group artifact version ex exclusions, and they, an empty exclusion list in this case, right? So it's just a macro, and we've expanded things. So why don't we have a tag class that is itself a macro for the thing we want to express? So this is functionally equivalent to this, but this works with Bazel 6. Um, the key thing here that's different is I've omitted it, but they, they should have the same name because then they get aggregated into the same set of dependencies. So this is really nice, and this is one of the first things I learned. Like, you've got to use macros in order to make your life easy, and then you can think of the tag classes as just being um, the parameters for those macros. Easy, right? Well, there's another problem. Um, this is, of course, the house of pain. Jump around. Uh, using repos. So when you're using Bizzlemod, you have to declare which repositories you are exporting and which are going to be available for the build. Um, each repo used by a rep module needs to be declared. This can be pretty verbose. Like, has anyone ever looked at their list of Java dependencies and sort of gasped in horrors? There are hundreds of the things. Same is true for, for Go developers and Python developers and Node.js. <laughs> um, it can be really hard to keep these lists in sync, right? In your module file, you can't load in other things that you can use to expand macros for you. Um, and so you tend to have a block of code that you have in your declaration of dependencies and then a simple transformation of that same data in uh, the use, re use repos block. That's complicated, that's error prone. I'm only human, believe it or not. And I make mistakes, everyone does. Like keeping that data in sync is really complicated. In rules JVM external, the way we work around this is with trampoline repos. So rather than having a separate repo for Guava, a separate repo for Failsafe, a separate repo, repo for Google Code Format, we have a single Maven repo. And that just contains aliases that point toward bits and pieces that people need. And because of the way that, that Bizzlemod works, this is a fine way of approaching things. That allows you to have a single dependency that you add to your use repo declaration, Maven, it, typically in this case. And it just means that, that life is a lot simpler for people. And there's one less place for things to go wrong. Of course, you don't need to use a trampoline repo. Like, I think it's really convenient and handy. But there is another way, and that's to use machinery and computers to do boring, repetitive tasks for you. In the Bazel world, the way that we tend to do this is with Gazelle. So Gazelle could be used to generate the use repo block that you wanted to do. Um, I believe that Rules Go is exploring this as a way of doing things. I am not aware of any project that is currently doing it at the moment. I favor trampoline repos because I'm simple and I don't like writing technology. Like the best line of code is the line of code you never have to write. So that leads us on to the second repo that I worked on, which was Apple Rules Lint. Um, if you're not familiar with Apple Rules Lint, uh, it is a framework for adding linters to your builds. So it has no linters itself, but it provides a framework for you to go like, with this well-known name, Java check style, for example, is there a configuration? Fantastic there is. Um, then I want to add these additional tests to the build. And your lint tests are available as actual underscore test classes. So they're run with Bazel, build, uh, Bazel test dot dot dot. So there's no way for your engineers to forget to run their lint tests. So when I started on this, I thought this is going to be really simple. right? Things can only get better. They can only get better. It has no external dependencies. All it needs to do is just set up a mapping, right? What could possibly go wrong? It turns out that Bazel lies to you when you're using Bazelmod. 
It uses this thing called repo remapping, which was available in Basel 5, but used by approximately zero people. Um, and what that allows you to do is go, this repo um, foo, I want to refer to as bar in my build, and it'll be fine. Bizelmod does that. So when you say, I want to pull in rules JVM external, it goes, I will let you refer to it as rules JVM external, but in reality, I'm going to call it rules JVM external, um, twiddle twiddle, version 4.5, twiddle, I love cheese, or whatever it is, right? It's a, some magnificent name mangling. And the way that Apple rules lint works is you give it a, a, a string that is a, t a label, right? That it will expand to a label and, and life will be sweet. But with repo remapping, that doesn't work. Bizelmod relies on repo remapping, so what are we going to do? Well, there's a new canonical label form. So traditionally, when you have a fully qualified label, it looks like at workspace name slash slash path colon target, right? The new canonical form uh, append, uh, prepends an additional at. So you have at at workspace name da 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 da. Now the nice thing with this is that when you pass that through label uh, through the label constructor, it doesn't get remapped again. So this is expanded fully. It doesn't go through the remapping, and everything works the way you expect it to. And that's magnificent. That is the thing that we needed in order to get Apple Rules Lint working with Bizelmod. Um, and thank you very much to the Basel team for hacking that in. Because I was like, I don't know how this is going to work. Because I couldn't pre-declare the, the uh, repos I was going to depend on, because that's defined by the user and not by my rule set. Ah. So, I mean, it's easy, right? Like everything's done. Except it wasn't. We're on to Contrib Rules JVM. If you're not familiar with Contrib Rules JVM and you're using Java, do check it out. It's really nice. I would say that I helped write it. Um, the main thing that it offers you is a set of utility macros. So if you want to set up test suites, for example, using Java, you can just give that Java test suite um, a list of your sources, and it will go, ah, these are test classes, and we'll put them each in their own Java test. And these are utility classes, which will compile as a library, which will make as a dependency of each of those tests. So it makes your maintain maintenance of your build files really easy. Um, and also, by generating separate tests, it allows you to parallelize nicely. And if you've got access to a remote build environment, like EngFlow, BuildBuddy, or, or BuildBarn, um, that scales beautifully, right? It also has a Gazelle plugin for generating your Bazel build files. So if you're using Java and you don't want to maintain your own build files, then take a look at that Gazelle plugin. It's really nice, um, and we believe it kind of works. Um, it uses information, by the way, that is in the rules JVM lock file. So if you ever need to know what packages are in the um, jars that you depend on, you can just take a look in that lock file, and that list of packages is available for you. So I thought this would be easy. It's not. It's like that. And that's the way it is. I'm not going to do the next line of the song, which I believe is, uh. Oh, damn it, I just did, didn't I? <laughs> Muppet. So we're, we're going to keep on moving. Uh, we're not going to stop yet. Uh, we do want to release a modernized version of Contrib Rules JVM, uh, but the thing that we need is that all of our transitive dependencies should also be in the BCR. Um, and the one that I'm looking for right now is um, Skylib. So Skylib has its own uh, Gazelle plugin that we make use of. And that, that plugin is, is super useful. It allows you to do uh, Bizel libraries, which helps with documentation. Um, and we're working on that, but it's not out yet. And so because our transitive dependency isn't there, we can't be released yet either. And I think this is going to be something that we see coming up more often. Like, God knows how they're going to get rules Docker out, which appears to, dep to depend on basically everything out there. So, I mean, the way that we have released Contrib Rules JVM in the Java 5, in the, in the Basel 5 ecosystem, is pretty simple. In our dependencies, we pull in Skylib and we patch it using the, the patch and, and patch args uh, that you get in, in HTTP archive, right? So that's, that's fine, right? In Bizelmod, that's no longer possible. And I'll be honest, I don't like it, but it's probably for the best. And that's because things get loaded in different orders. And so our patch to Bizelmod will be applied, uh, to, to Skylib will be applied if we get loaded, for, if we are the ones responsible for loading Skylib. But if someone else loads Skylib, 
I don't think we need those. I'm going to be there. And we're going to end up with weird failures in your build. And you're going to be scratching your head going like, sure, that should have worked. So what can you do? Well, in order of difficulty, here are the things that we can try. First one is upstream fixes. This is what we've done with Basil Skylib. We've taken the fixes that we wanted to do. We have put together a PR. Um, and working together with the Skylib devs, um, there's going to be, at some point, the Gazelle plugin available as a separate module in the BCR. And that's all we need. Like, that's going to be great. The other thing that we could have done, which might seem easier, but probably in the long run isn't, because you have to maintain this going forward, is to work around the problem. Like, what we could have done is put, like, well, if you're using Contrib Rules JVM through BizzleMod, then you don't get the Gazelle plugin. But we can arrange things so that um, you know you, every build won't fail. Like you can still use the macros, you can still use some of the supporting functions. Everything will be fine. And we could have done that by making sure that the things that required pieces that weren't in the BCR were in build files that weren't referenced normally. And it's kind of ugly, and it's kind of mad. And it's kind of something I don't really, really don't want to do. The third option we have, which is probably what a lot of companies are going to do, is to host your own uh, BizzleMod registry. Right Now, these things layer. So you can go through the first registry. And if an item isn't in there, it'll go to the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one, and so on and so forth. So you will probably have the BCR, the Basel Central Registry, as a backstop. And then the rule sets where you want to apply your patches will be in your company registry or your organization registry. right? Um, that requires that everyone in an organization or group knows that they should use that registry and can agree on which patches should be applied and why. That isn't always easy, but it's probably possible within a single org or, or company. Does that make sense? I hope it does, because that's the end of that slide. The other problem is polluted workspaces. So particularly now, we're on the cusp of BizzleMod becoming a thing, but not everyone's able to move to it yet. We need our rule sets to work with both Basel 5 and with Basel 6. Um, so it's nice to be able to test with them. The thing that I knew but didn't really think about very deeply is that although you've got a module.basel file in a project, your workspace file is still parsed and analyzed and used, and it can set up all sorts of things. And this can lead to unexpected dependency imports. In the case of Contrib Rules JVM, the thing that I found was that I was pulling in a more recent version of Rules Go in the module file, an older version in the workspace. And because I was relying on some features that were only present in the more recent one, when I was running the build, nothing worked. It was so frustrating. It was like, the thing I need is definitely there. What's going on? And it took forever to figure it out. Um, and when I did, I felt like a bit of a fool. It's like, how am I going to work around this? It's not very clear. It wasn't very clear to me. But you can create a workspace.bizzlemod. And that will take precedence over your local workspace or workspace.bazel. So if you're using Bazel 6, I really recommend, if you're using bizzlemod, recommend just creating a workspace.bizzlemod that just has your workspace declaration that contains a name. and then. Uh, when you're doing a BizzleMod build, you know that everything is coming from the module descriptor. And th so that is how people are going to be using it. Um, you can, of course, continue to use your workspace.bizzleMod to load dev time dependencies or things that you need for your tests or stuff like that. But I guess ultimately, we want everything to be in module.bazel, right? Yeah, there's, there's nodding from people working on Bazel. So I'm going to say, yes, in the future, that's what we want. Um, that's a really important tip. It took me so long to find that out. I felt like a fool when I found it. So here's where our story ends. We've migrated three rule sets over to BizzleMod. Um, but there are some final thoughts and, and, and things. First one is that my mental model for BizzleMod is that because the modules declare all their dependencies and repos, they shouldn't cause any unwanted downloads, right? Um, Alex Eagle refers to these as eager fetches, um, and he's right to do that. Like, you know when you do your build, and the very first thing it does is it downloads Go and then Rust. You're like, but I just want to build this Java target. <laughs> like, we've all seen it, right? Or it starts, I don't know, compiling the protobuf compiler. Yes, we've all seen the proto-c compiler compiling, right? That's how I know I'm using Bazel. 
Um, so my mental model was that, that modules are free because they don't need to do anything. Except they're not, right? The module functions get run, the extension functions get run, um, potentially with every build, right? So they get run when you restart the Bazel server, um, and they get run when you change the inputs, right? Um, and that's fine, that's great, that's magnificent. But when you run them, they can reach out to download resources, um, particularly when setting up toolchain. So if there's a call to register toolchain, it reaches out to the internet, it downloads everything, and away we go. Um, when you depend on rules go, this happens in particular, right? Because the, the, the rules go will set up a default uh, go toolchain if you don't pre-declare one. And so um, it was a, my original plan with Skylib was like, I'll just have rules go because my mental model was this will be free, and my mental model was wrong. Now with Bazel 7, my understanding is there should be a single lock file that BizzleMod uses for itself. You will probably end up having separate lock files for you know, your various tooling, but BizzleMod will maintain a central lock file. Um, and that should prevent the need to run the module extensions with every build, right? So they should be run far less frequently, right? So, so that solves the problem, right? Like all the pre-declared, all the inputs are now pre-declared. Um, and so Bazel should not download things when they're not needed. Except that's not true, because when they call register toolchain, they will still need to go and download things. Um, people are aware of these problems, and there are ways to work around this. So rules go right now is trying to pull um, the tool the toolchains into a separate repo. So although there will be an eager load of that, it won't actually do very much because it'll be super lightweight. All right, so there'll be far less work need needed to be done. And things can start up sooner, quicker, easier, quicker, cleaner. And there's one final problem. Because as we start moving more and more things into our module.bazel file, that thing is going to get big. So your runtime dependencies for your project or your repo or your rule set are probably not that large. right? There's probably not that many things that you depend on. But when you're writing tests, you might need a lot more. In the case of rules JVM external, we set up, I don't know, five or six different uh, Maven installs with different flag settings and different configurations that we only use in our tests. And they have to go in the module.bazel. So that thing's going to get big and unwieldy. It's going to be hard to read. Um, there's not much you can do about that. What you can do is not expose your users to the full horror of that. So if you have a dependency that you're only using for devs uh, for, at dev time, you can declare that as the extension. You can say, this is a dev time dependency. And when your project isn't the root project, meaning the one that, that you're running the build from, um, when it's pulled in transitively, those dev time dependencies won't be downloaded. So that will make the build faster for people who are using the rule set. You're still going to have an absolutely gargantuan module.bazel, but at least you're not going to be affecting people too much. And with that, Everybody, thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, if you have enjoyed any of the 90s playlist mentions and you have Apple Music, you can download it there and just get some earworms for the rest of your day. Um, I both apologize and make no apologies for that. Thank you very much for your time and attention and enjoy those. <laughs>